Hey everybody, it's Savannah once again, and this video is the first in a three video series of how I made this Captain Flint cosplay from Black Sails. This costume in particular is from Season 4. Okay, so here's my shirt mock-up. Overall, the pattern worked pretty good. I will say that there's several small changes that I need to make. First of all, you can probably notice that this pleating ended up being much wider than the original. And I think that's mainly because I based the pleats on the stripes and the stripes are bigger than the actual fabric that I'm going to be using. So that's probably going to be taken care of as far as that goes when I go to switch to the other fabric. This collar needs to be reduced a little bit. It will not lay correctly because it's a stretchy polyester fabric and I can't press it. So that's a little frustrating, but once again, it will probably not be an issue on the real one. And then, let's see, the sleeves are kind of doing a weird thing. For one thing, I, I didn't clip anything in here, so that's one of the problems. But another thing is that I need to bring, there's this shoulder panel. It's supposed to actually sit more like that. I think it needs to be brought forward more and that will help me also distribute these gathers in the back a little bit better. Now his, you can tell his shirt does do this, like you can see actual wrinkles right here when he wears it in the show. So I'm not too concerned about that, but I'm concerned about the armpit depth, so I'm probably going to add a, a triangular gather, or not gather, a triangular gore. And after looking at the pictures again, his armpit does go about halfway down his torso. So I'm thinking that they do have a gore in it. Overall, not too bad. This mannequin's actually smaller than the recipient of this costume, so the pants don't fit quite correctly, and they need to be reduced anyways. Overall, I'm happy with how the pattern turned out. It's just several small changes that need to be made. There's also, on the actual show shirt, I don't know exactly what's going on, but in the back, there's a panel, and it doesn't look like a seam, but there's a panel that runs from here down here, and I can't tell, you know, how far it goes down, because all I have is pictures. It's really hard to see in the show, because he's, usually when he's got a shirt off, it seems like he's somewhere dark. But I don't know if I'm going to include that. I kind of think that it might be extra seam allowance, that they've just fell down, so that they can interchange between actors and stunt doubles and such. But anyways, that's the prototype, mock-up, whatever you want to call it. Like I said, still things to figure out, but I'm pretty confident to move forward from here. Okay, so the recipient of the Captain Flint cosplay came over and we looked at all these swatches and determined that this one over here was our favorite. And then this one, it's hard to see in this lighting. This button right here was the favorite. So I'm going to dye the fabric for the shirt today. It's kind of exciting to finally get started on it. It's because it's taken so long just to do the initial research. But let's go talk about what I'm going to do to dye this. Okay, so here's the fabric. It is a cotton quilting fabric from Joann's. And then I have a wine color writ dye, a dark brown, and a tangerine. And this is going to be a one to one to one half ratio. And then per the recommendations on the instructions, I'm going to use five teaspoons of liquid dish soap and then two cups of salt. And then I've put, I think it's nine gallons of water in this tub and then I have three gallons boiling on the stove just to make sure it's efficiently hot. I mean, I use hot sink water for this tub, but it usually cools down by the time I get outside, so I go ahead and boil some just to have another hot source of water. So Summer's going to help me carry this outside, and I'm going to go ahead and just pre-mix all these dyes inside of a jar before I go out there, too, just to make carrying stuff a little bit easier. Oh, and also, this fabric has just been washed. It is still wet. That way, all any finishes or anything that they might have put on it is cleared away. Okay, so here's the fabric. It's been washed and dried inside of the washer and the dryer. And this is the original sample that we agreed upon. And I'm happy to report that they turned out really similar. 
which makes me happy because I always end up having issues with sizing up ratios and stuff with dyeing, but this time it turned out really well. Oh, thank you for interrupting. But now it's time to work on the pattern and see how, what I need to do to change it. The first step to making the shirt was to create all the details on the front first. To begin, I needed to make the slit opening in the neckline. I started by lining up the stitching in the slash lines with the stripes on the fabric. I then stitched around the slash line with a very small stitch. I then cut along the slash line and flipped the facing piece to the front instead of to the back like you normally would. Thanks to everything being lined up correctly, the stripe pattern looked continuous. I then folded the raw edges under so that I could pin the facing down to the front and top stitch it. Using the reference photos and the stripes as the guide for spacing, I made a vertical pin tuck next to the facing. I finished the pin tuck and pressed it away from the facing. I then created an inverted box pleat of sorts by making two opposing pleats. I gauged the size by once again referencing a photo. I then top stitched this down so that it would stay in place permanently. After top stitching the inverted box pleat, I actually made one more vertical pin tuck but I forgot to film it. So here's the first set of pleating complete. Actually, kind of hard to see it since there's a design, but you can pull on it and kind of see. And it came out much smaller than the other shirt, which makes me happy. It's because the stripes are actually closer to the actual size of the original garment. I'm excited. It's still probably a little bit bigger than the actual original garment is. I do wish that this was sitting more closed, but I think I can probably finagle that whenever I go to put that little facing strip on it right there. So that's just one of the things I'd fix, but I didn't want to make this too close together and then clip it and then have it fray. That wouldn't be good, so that's how I'm going to deal with that, but I gotta put this camera on the charger and then do this other side. So I guess I'll check in with you once I get the other side done. To create the facing patch under the slit, I marked a box about an inch high and slightly longer than the pleat details. This would encase the slash line I needed to make in order to gather the bottom portion of the shirt. I drew the slash line exactly in half of the box and then proceeded to stitch around the slash line. I then removed the bottom stitch line when I realized I needed that fabric to be free for gathering. It just goes to show that no matter how experienced you are with sewing, you still make stupid mistakes. And the good thing is, is that most of the time they can be fixed. I then carefully cut the fabric at the slash line and made two rows of gathering stitches on the bottom portion only.
I lined up the facing patch onto the gathered fabric, still using the stitch line of the box as a guide. I stitched this down by machine, cut it to size, and then folded the edges under to create a rectangular patch. I pinned the top down and fixed the gap in the slit at the same time. I then whip stitched the rest of the patch down by hand. I then made an identical patch on the inside and stitched it down totally by hand. Now all the gathering edges were safely and securely enclosed and it was time to put on all of the trim for this shirt. The black soutache braid was relatively easy to find, however I could not find anything close to the brown woven trim, at least in the size that I needed. So I endeavored to make it myself, which will continue to be a theme throughout this entire cosplay. I found some hemp string at our local Walmart. It was the right color, but it was still a little too large of a string to what I needed. So I carefully separated the individual strands of this string to make an even thinner one. I then took two long strands of this thinnest string and tied a knot in the middle. I used a pin board to hold it down and began making tiny four strand fishtail braids. To make the strands easier to deal with, I wound them up on my fingers and turned them into little bundles, almost like bobbins on bobbin lace. As I worked, I figured out how to make the braids more quickly and improve their look. Once I got two long fishtail braids made, I pinned them into place, keeping them one half inch apart. I then placed a single piece of their original string down the middle of the two braids. I began what I can only describe as a looping needle lace stitch down either side of the middle strand. Using an embroidery needle, I began by tying off on the left braid, then looping around the middle strand using the same motion as a back stitch. I then pointed the needle back into that same braid, but further down the plait. I then repeated this process on the right side. I had worked down the braids alternating sides every stitch, except for after the first stitch was in place, I would always catch the top of the previous loop to tie everything in together. I was a little inconsistent at first, but I soon got a rhythm going and the pattern became a little more even. None of the trim is perfect, but the beauty of it is that it really doesn't have to be. And it turned out much more close to the original than anything else I could find. Here's the trim and some of the buttons all mapped out fairly close to the measurements that I got in the pictures. That might need some adjustment once I actually get it on the shirt because I don't know how big the pleats and stuff on the front detail are going to be. But pretty cool. I think it looks good. The corners and stuff will be a little bit sharper when I can actually tack them down with some thread, but right now I just got pins holding everything. Once I finished the trim, I pinned it into the general shape of the original to see how it would look. I arranged it onto the shirt front just to see what it would look like, but then I used a large back stitch to attach the soutache braid to the shirt first. I heavily used a reference photo for this since my shirt's design had ended up being slightly larger than the original. Once the soutache was all tacked down, I then laid the brown trim over the top and tacked it down with a back stitch as well. After the front details were complete, I started to actually construct the shirt. To put the shoulders together, I sandwiched the front shirt pieces in between the two pairs of shoulder patches. I stitched these together, then pinned the back shoulder seams to the top shoulder patch only, right sides together. I pressed the seams and then turned the open edges of the shoulder patch down and whip stitched them closed. I then created the collar by folding the piece in half with the right sides together, 
I stitched both ends closed and then turned the collar out and pressed it. I then sandwiched the unfinished end of the collar piece between the two neckband pieces and sewed the three sides up so that the collar was attached to the neckband with only one bottom edge open. Before attaching the collar to the shirt, I first needed to add one last piece of brown trim along the edge of the entire collar. I then put two rows of gathered stitches into the back piece's neckline. I then pulled the gather threads to fit the neckline of the shirt into the neckband of the collar. I pinned this in place and stitched it with the machine and then whip stitched the open end over all of the exposed seams. It was now time to make all the buttons for the shirt. These buttons are called dorset buttons or dorset cartwheel buttons. If you want a detailed video of how to make this type of button, I have linked the full tutorial I used in the description box below. I used a large jewelry jump ring for the base of these buttons. I squeezed the rings fully closed with some pliers and then put a small piece of tape over the cut in the rings to ensure that the thread couldn't slip through the crack. I doubled up some black upholstery thread on a needle and then wrapped the ring using a blanket stitch. I worked all the way around the ring until the metal was completely covered. I then turned the ridge the blanket stitch created on the outside of the ring to the inside. I then wrapped the ring with my thread in such a way that it created the spokes of the wheel. This was the hardest part of the buttons because you have to keep a constant tension on the thread and keep the spokes even. I had to redo some of the buttons several times because of this. I then created the hub of the wheels or the buttons by putting a stitch in and out of opposing pairs of spokes so that everything was secure from the middle. It was then just a matter of wrapping each of the spokes with thread all the way around the button to finish filling it in. When the button was complete, I then took my needle and put the thread through to the middle of the button. I then tied it off several times and then cut the thread as long as I could matching the other beginning thread. That way there would be something to attach the button to the shirt. Using a reference photo I then attached the buttons to the shirt using that thread that I left at the end of each of the buttons. Using the same upholstery thread as the buttons, I created little loops on the opposite side of the neckline. A full tutorial of how to make these thread loops is in the description as well. At this point, it was almost a shirt, it just needed the sleeves and a hem. I carefully matched up the sleeve piece to the shirt shoulder seam. I did a risky thing and just went ahead and added the gussets without checking them on a mock-up. I did however try them on just to make sure that they worked before serging the shoulder seam. After checking I then searched just the shoulder part of the sleeve. I carefully measured out the wrist opening for the sleeve and then matched up the rest of the sleeve seam and side seam together. I then sewed the seam all the way down and searched each individual seam allowance. I then made the wristbands by sewing around three sides of the pieces and leaving one end open for the sleeve to be gathered into. I put two rows of gathered stitches into the ends of the sleeves and carefully fit them into the wristbands. 
making sure that the seam allowances were folded to where there would be a nice clean edge on the wrist opening. I then sewed this down by machine, folded everything inside of the wristband, and whip stitched it closed. After finishing the wristbands, I then went ahead and did a whip stitch down each side of the wrist opening just to make sure that the seam allowances stayed closed. I also put a small running stitch down each of the wristbands. This was an added decorative detail that I could see on the original, but I also did it so that ironing wouldn't be totally necessary each time this got washed and dried. Then to finish the sleeves off, I added the doors and wheel buttons. The last thing I needed to do was add a machine stitched hem and the shirt was finally done. This shirt ended up taking me a total of 47 hours to complete. That includes making all the brown trim and the buttons, but not the mock-up. Even though it didn't turn out as exact as I hoped, I really loved it and wanted one of my own, and so did everyone else in my household. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for the second video in this series where I show you how I made the pants.